Good afternoon, and welcome to the third annual Fischlinger Family Lecture. My name is Sally Simpson. I am the director of the Center for the Study of Business Ethics, Regulation, and Crime, which is hosting the event today, along with the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, the Robert H. Smith School of Business, and our sponsors, the Fischlinger family. Many thanks to the Terrapin alums, Bill and Matt Fischlinger, who are here today, and we are grateful for your support for this event and your support of other Seabrook activities. Thank you. Now before... And before I introduce our speakers, let me acknowledge Amy Flickeager, our Seabrook faculty assistant, for all of her hard work. In addition, thanks to our friends in BSOS, Deb, Laura, Sarah, and Michelle, who worked closely with Amy to successfully pull off this event. And now I am extremely honored to introduce our participants, although neither needs much introduction. Barney Frank is a former congressman from Massachusetts and author, who among other very important activities was co-author of the 2010 Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act that placed major regulatory oversight on the financial industry after the Great Recession of 2008-2009. Tom Edsel is an opinion columnist and author who in various capacities and for different news organizations, currently the New York Times, has covered national politics. Today, in a question and answer format, our participants will ask Mr. Edsel and respond, Mr. Frank, to a series of questions about the status of the Dodd-Frank Act in 2010 when it was enacted versus 2019. At the end of their discussion, we will open it up for questions from the audience. Now, concluding the Q&A today will be a brief reception where we will have the opportunity to demonstrate a little Terrapin hospitality to our guests. So with no further ado, Tom, if you'll begin. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here at the University of Maryland uh, with the School of Business and the uh, College of Behavioral and Social Sciences. I was glad to hear you have a program in the ethics of business. Uh, which could be certainly a good service these days. I also want to note that Peter Reuter, my friend from the Public Policy School, is here, uh, and I'm glad to see him. Uh, we are honored to have Barney Frank, who served many years in Congress, worked in the Kevin White administration in Boston, and uh, is one of the smarter politicians you did are you going to run into uh, anywhere, state, local, or federal. Uh, before we get started on, on the details of Barney, of uh, Dodd-Frank, I thought maybe you might talk about how you got into politics and uh, what motivated you. Yes, uh, I had to give this a lot of thought to write a memoir. <clears throat> I uh, was interested in politics early. For, uh, my father was what we would today call an early adopter. He bought a television set in 1940. People didn't think there was one. Um, and uh, I remember watching the Keith Falber Crime Committee hearings in 1950, which were televised. I was 10. They were about organized crime. And I didn't fully understand it, but I was fascinated. I just got interested in politics because of that. And a couple of years later, uh, two events uh, happened in 1954. One was the murder of Emmett Till, the young black man from Mississippi who was brutally killed. He was from Chicago, killed visiting in Mississippi. Uh, law enforcement did nothing. I was appalled to find out that the local law enforcement had been part of the crime, and also that because of Southern political clout and the filibuster, there was no federal jurisdiction. Um, at the same time, I watched the Army McCarthy hearings. And uh, I had also learned in school that I, was, uh, uh, I had verbal skills, and uh, particularly oral. I, I talked good. And uh, <laughs> so I thought, gee, this is something I'd like to do. And the motivation was uh, to make the world better. I mean, I, I was defensive against McCarthy, do things about civil rights. 
uh, the problem was that I, uh, I, I had realized by then that I was gay, and I had this dilemma, which was, I knew to be successful in politics in 1954, uh, you had to be popular, Dwight Eisenhower, widely beloved. Uh, on the other hand, I also knew that being gay at that point was uh, a way to be very unpopular. And I wondered how I was gonna reconcile them. Uh, to jump ahead, uh, what I then had was a career w in which gradually the sort of relative respectability of those shifted like some uh, pulley. And by the time I retired, it was much more socially acceptable to be gay than to be a politician. Um, <laughs> my marriage in 2012 actually polled better, I'm told, than uh, the uh, Frank bill. But I uh, figured at first that I would be an assistant to people because I could not uh, be a candidate with all that exposure. So I started out working, as Tom mentioned, in a campaign and I worked for the mayor of Boston. And then I got elected to the state legislature in 1972 from a, a very unusual, atypical district in Boston, downtown Boston, Back Bay, Beacon Hill. It was kind of yuppie inhabited before the term yuppie was involved. And it turned out I was good at legislating. I had before that figured I was gonna be an academic and, and do the thing about have a faculty position, but then you know, go into politics, but be able to come back out again, given my being gay and not, not be around long enough to get exposed. Um, so I enrolled in a PhD program. Uh, I took some time off to go to work for Kevin White. And I then had to make a choice whether I was gonna try and stay in politics or be an academic. And I did it based on a, uh, a personal characteristic, which I had to recognize, which was an advantage in being particularly a legislator or an across the board political administrator, uh, but a disadvantage in being an academic. I have a very short attention span. And uh, I mean, seriously. So uh, a lot of serious, thoughtful people are totally distracted by being in a job where you have to switch gears every uh, hour at best. And so I went into politics and turned out to be uh, better at that than, than anything else and stayed. So being a, having attention deficit disorder is a good... Uh, well, it helps with, uh, with, with uh, for politics. I should add, the motivation continued to be the same, to make, make the world better, um, I, uh, fairer uh, economically and in terms of discriminations. I, um, what, what evolved by, after some trial and error, I had by the, uh, by the time I got to Congress, I was 40 years old, I decided what I would try to do would be to work for the leftward most politically acceptable uh, positions that could be, both as to public policy and to candidates, which I say has again become somewhat relevant within the Democratic Party. Um, just to go a little further on this, being gay was a central part of your sort of calculations? Oh, no question. How did, how did that change, or when did it change? Um, when did it become? It changed, in the, it changed as the society changed. Um, there, there were very few social movements in American history where there was a day. The Stonewall riots, clearly things just transformed enormously in 1969. Um, and, and there's been this great society. I was asked by a reporter to a former paper at the Post what I made of uh, Pete Buttigieg. And uh, I said, I, I was actually very happy that I'm not taking a position point for, for a candidate, but I'm very happy he's running because I was really struck that his being gay and married is no big deal. And I said, in fact, I guess I could summarize it, borrowing from Joe Biden, my sexuality, as far as politics is concerned, has gone from BFD to NBD, and it's been uh, a nice thing to see. But um, I, uh, I decided that I could not run for office, so I would be an assistant and be a professor and, and use that. And then a chance to run for office came, but I figured, okay, I can run for this office, but I can only win in this particular uh, unusual district of a uh, highly college-educated, there were a lot of gay people living there, although it wasn't, it wasn't that public. And um, I then decided I could stay in politics for about 
tenured, that I would be privately, uh, I, I'd be very ambiguous about my uh, sexuality, and I would just sacrifice my sexuality to a public life, a choice I think other people say they made. I found that to be not only impossible, but destructive. Uh, in my experience, every human being has needs, physical and emotional, that, that you, you cannot simply suppress. And if you try and channel all that into your work, it, it negatively affects your work, particularly, you know, maybe it wouldn't if you were working with inanimate materials, but if you're in a business where you're interacting with people and you're just pissed off all the time and angry and jealous of other people, angry at yourself, it has a negative effect on, on, your, on your ability to uh, function. I'll jump ahead, when I did decide to come out publicly in 1987 as a member of Congress, most of my liberal straight friends who heard about it asked me not to do it because they were afraid, as I was, that it might diminish my effectiveness in the broader political arena, but I said, I can't help it, I, I can't live this way. Uh, it turned out, um, after I did it, they said, well, we're glad you did that because you're better at the job now because that, that personal problem is gone. So I, I, at first I was gonna keep it totally a secret. Then I got elected to Congress and I said, oh, here's the deal, I'm gonna go to Washington and I'm gonna live in Washington. I compared it to Switzerland during the war. Uh, I think a lot of the, everybody knew who the spies were in Switzerland, but they didn't shoot each other because they needed some kind of rest area. Um, Washington at the time, there were all kinds of sexual activity going on that we all agreed to keep secret from the public because we had this mutual interest in having this, this haven. Obviously that's broken down. But um, I said, okay, I'm gonna live the life of a gay man privately, but be uh, uh, silent publicly. I wasn't gonna lie and say I was straight, but I just wasn't gonna deal with it. And I tried that for a few years and it didn't work real well. And I got myself in trouble by uh, kind of finding outlets that I had to keep secret. And so I finally decided um, I was gonna make the announcement that I was gay. It was interesting from the journalistic standpoint, the journalistic argument then, and still pretty much now was, that you, you did not ask public officials, or I guess others, if they were gay or lesbian, um, and you could not volunteer it unless it became relevant to a story. Unfortunately, the only stories to which it became relevant were stories in which there was misbehavior. So for a while, the only prominent people who were known to be gay either had AIDS or had done things they shouldn't have done. Uh, and well, I ultimately had a problem. I wasn't gonna wait for that. In 1987, I just volunteered that I was gay, but I ran into it. I did a dance with the Boston Globe. I, they, they would ask me, could, but by that time, it, people knew I was gay, but I, everybody, was in this conspiracy of silence. I, um, they would ask me if I, if I could, uh, if they could write about it. Bob Healy, who you probably know is a great journalist at the Boston Globe, actually came down and asked me about it. And I said, no, I'm not ready to do that, Bob. And he was worried. I said, well, I'll make you a promise. If anybody else is gonna help me, they'll call me. And uh, I promise I'll let you know. So the Globe wouldn't be scooped. It would have been embarrassing for the leading paper in New England to be scooped on that. So. Um, I, uh, then I decided, well, I'm not gonna wait, I'm gonna say it. So I said to the Globe reporter, look, I'm ready to, uh, to come out. And they said, okay, well, where's your statement? I said, well, you have to ask me, um, because I, this is, again, relevant to your question. At that point, I figured I could survive being out politically, although it might put a limit on, on getting beyond being a congressman. I was delighted to be a congressman. That didn't trouble me that that was my peak. but. Um, I wanted to be able to say that it was no big deal. Um, a little earlier, so then I'm going to be funny. And I said, here's the problem. I want to be able to say that was what we thought would work at the time. Yeah, I'm gay, but so what? You know, it doesn't affect my job, et cetera. I said, but I want to be able to say people shouldn't bring it up because it's not that relevant. But if I had announced it, I would be in a hard position saying, by the way, that's not relevant. Well, why the hell do you tell everybody then if it's not relevant? So the answer was, well, I answered a question because I tried to have a reputation for honesty. So we went back and forth and they said, well, we can't ask you, that's against our rules. But then they were afraid it was gonna leak out. So they, uh, uh, they sent a reporter down to ask me and she put the tape recorder on and said, are you gay? I said, 
in my strategy. Yeah, so what? And uh, what happened was the reaction was better than I thought it was going to be. And uh, from there, I was able to go forward. Very interesting. Um, let's switch to Dodd Frank. Is that bill the most important thing you did in Congress? Or what, what would you say? Yes and no, Tom. It clearly had the most impact on society. To me, there were two other things that I considered to be morally more important, uh, but I wasn't as successful. One was legislating against any LGBT discrimination. We've made progress, not as dramatic. They're about to finish that up. Uh, I, the, the House is going to pass a very big bill. The other was uh, my, my major public policy focus was to try to bring down housing costs for people. I, I was able to do some, not as much as I'd like. I think that again is going to be on the agenda. So those were the two moral causes. In fact, when I became chairman of the committee in 2007, I thought, okay, housing is going to be my issue. And then, you know, with, with appropriate reductions in scale, I, I felt like Lyndon Johnson and, and, and uh, Woodrow Wilson, both of whom became president, determined to have these far-reaching social, economically redistributive agendas and wound up spending a lot of that capital on war. And in my case, I came in to do financial reform, uh, to do housing, and instead I had this economy collapse and we had to do financial reform. But in terms of impact on the society, uh, clearly it was the financial reform bill. I was, it may sound awkward, I will not be calling it Dodd-Frank because in my experience, Anybody in politics who refers to himself in the third person looks like a twit. With the <laughs> single exception of Charles de Gaulle, who was able to call himself de Gaulle and, and look, get away with it. But um, what I will say is that it has held up very well. When we passed it, it was attacked from the left as inadequate and from the right as too restrictive. And I think both have turned out not to be true. Uh, my you know, quick repost to people on the right, Donald Trump in particular, is he makes two claims that are relevant here. One, that we have the best economy in the history of the world. Didn't leave it there, I think. Yeah. We have the best economy in the history of the world. And two, Chris Dodd and I crippled the major engine of that economy. Um, if, in fact, we had done the damage that he claimed, it wouldn't have been the case. And I think it has, it has not been an undue restraint on legitimate economic activity, and it has, in fact, substantially retarded bad stuff. Uh, if you could redo the 2010 bill, what would you do? I would strengthen one thing in particular. Um, I think the single biggest cause of it took various manifestations of the problem was that the financial community had found both the resources and the means of taking on risk, creating risk for the society without being responsible for it. They found a way to uh, make money by lending to other people and then shifting responsibility. Um, they would make loans and then they would sell the right to collect on the loans to somebody else and not care. So that they, they, their incentive went from the quality of loans to the quantity of loans. What we came up with was the uh, notion that anybody who made loans or incurred debt had to retain some responsibility financially in case the debts weren't repaid. People call it skin in the game. It was some that when you made a pack of loans and you sold them as a security, you had to be responsible for at least five percent of the losses and you took them up top. And that got that got weakened a little bit. It's still there. Um, and I noticed actually uh, just read a story at some court we can do it a little bit, and what happened was one senator working with some of the real estate people said, well, they didn't want every mortgage loan. We, we were going to have two kinds of home mortgage loans, the kind you couldn't make at all because they were so outrageous, and the kind you could make but you had to retain uh, a part of, you, you, you had a loss of retention. And they said, well, no, you, we need a third category of loans that are so good that you don't need the loss of retention. And um, what, what happened was this particular senator uh, 
was able to become Senator 60. Um, you needed 60 votes to pass it. We had just 59 senators, we had 60, Teddy Kennedy died, and Chris Dodd had his hands full. In fact, on the side, people asked me, why is the bill so big? Well, it was gonna be originally like seven separate bills. And talking to Dodd, he said, hey pal, I gotta get 60 votes for this. I may be able to get 60 votes once. No way I can survive getting 60 votes seven times. So we, that's why it became one big bill. It's in fact, you know, it, it's a lot of different subjects put together that way, each considered separately in the House. But um, he would say to me, look, I, you know, I need 60 votes. And this, from time to time, a senator would say, a Democratic senator or a Republican, because we need, in the end, we had three Republicans to vote with us. Um, I need this. And you, at some point, they had the gun and you had to give in. So this one senator said, got to create a third category. And the third category, the way it was written, I said, I mean, I just, it, it ate, the exception ate up the rule. So uh, most home mortgages, ironically, are not subject to that risk retention. And they were the major cause. Others are, and it, and it helps. So I, I would have very much tightened that uh, risk retention part. The other thing I would have done, we had in the House bill, uh, we lost it in the Senate from the consumer standpoint, I would have outlawed the ability of uh, financial institutions to require that their customers sign on to arbitration in cases of dispute. Uh, the Senate blocked that. They would only, they, we did give the financial regulators the power to do that. They haven't used it yet. Other than that, it was, I would leave it pretty much as is. Well, I take it back, we did, make a couple of changes. We, um, we took the Volcker rule, which says you can't, if you're a bank, get into these derivatives unless it's for your own purpose. And we, um, we applied it to everybody, but we never thought it was gonna be an issue for smaller banks, because they don't do that. Uh, but they said proving that they didn't do it became a big burden. So the bill did pass, which I supported that piece of it, to exempt banks under 10 billion from the Volcker rule. The other thing is we said 50 billion was the limit at which you became a really, you got extra scrutiny. That was probably too low, probably should have been 100. They made it 250, and I thought that was too high. But the uh, requiring everybody to do the risk retention would have been the one big thing. Was that third mortgage option in effect like the A ratings that they used prior? It was supposed to be that, but then they broadened it, so. It's now uh, used for everything. Yeah, there, so there are now two categories, ones you can't make, and then the, 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 any, any mortgage that passes muster as acceptable, there's no risk retention. How did the regulatory bodies deal with Dodd-Frank? Did they treat it as it should be treated, or did they? Well, that's, uh, that's a key question now. Um, better than I had hoped, obviously under the Obama administration, basically supportive, although they, they gave in and they wrote, we gave them discretion to say what was the level of risk retention and they used it to kind of gut it all. They did it at the urging of a lot of liberal groups and banks and uh, two of us disagreed, Sheila Bear, who'd been the head of the FDIC, um, and uh, she, she'd been appointed by George W. Bush and she was the kind of David Souter of financial regulation, that is a very liberal Republican appointed by a Bush who obviously didn't realize what he was doing. Um, but uh, the, um, the regulators were very supportive and we'd worked very closely with the regulators, including, and I wanna point this out, because uh, you know, uh, what we did was very bipartisan, not just in responding to the crisis, but if you read the memoirs of three of the top financial regulators appointed by George W. Bush, Secretary of the Treasury Henry Paulson, Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke, and Sheila Bear, the head of the FDIC, they are not only supportive of what we did in the bill, they take credit for it legitimately. We worked closely with them, so they were, they were very supportive. Paulson didn't like the Volcker rule, but the basis, basics they liked. The first set of uh, Trump administrators were better than we thought they would be. Uh, Christopher Giancarlo, who's the head of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, explicitly said he liked the bill. And by the way, that's the one area 
derivatives, which were a major problem. That's what got AIG into trouble. Quick example. AIG, they invented something called credit default swaps, which is a form of insurance that's not called insurance, so you get out from under the rules. A credit default swap is this. Somebody buys a security composed of a lot of mortgages. The mortgages then don't pay off because they were imprudently granted. If you bought that security, you then bought a credit default swap whereby the person who sold you that credit default swap has to make up any losses you've got on the security. And people were able to do that with no requirement that the people selling the credit default swaps could meet their obligation. The biggest one was AIG, which had made so much money in insurance and all the what to do with it. So they sold a bunch of credit default swaps. They not only didn't have the money to back it up, they had no idea how much they owed. And I really like to stress this as an example of how bad things were. Bernanke told us one week in September that, he, 80, that AIG was 85 billion in debt beyond what they could pay. The next week, counting up when he said, then we'll need 85 billion for AIG. We said, members of Congress, you already told us that. He said, oh no, I'm sorry, that's another 85 billion. <laughs> AIG was $170 billion, they didn't know it. Um, so uh, Giancarlo, and so derivatives were a major part of the problem. Giancarlo uh, was very good about that. And then um, the Fed is the single biggest regulator, and uh, Jerome Powell, who uh, Trump made head of the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board and has been attacking ever since, um, is very supportive of him. So now there was a, the, the bank guys are less supportive, uh, the head of the new control of the currency, but we don't really know because the control of the currency has a term that overlaps the president. So uh, we don't know exactly what the uh, control of the currency would do. Uh, they are beginning to loosen it some. At this point, nothing that I think is terribly damaging, and not, uh, nothing for the very big banks. The, the, the major ones have not been. These are for the ones in the range of 200, 300 uh, billion in, uh, in assets. They made one change in the Volcker rule, which Volcker himself said he didn't think was that bad. So they've been better than I thought they would be, with one glaring exception, and that is totally gutting the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau by putting Mulvaney in there, who'd voted against it, uh, disingenuously said, oh, it was never meant to have all these powers. In fact, you go back and read what he said during the debates, and he knew he was going to have those powers, that's why he voted against it. I mean, they, they accurately described it in trying to kill it, and then said, oh, we didn't know that. But uh, with the exception of CFPB, they have not done serious damage. What does uh, your success and also the continued enforcement by the regulatory agencies say about the banking lobby, which is supposedly one of the strongest in the city, but they appear to have, and especially the big banks, have taken it on the chin to some extent. Excellent question. And in fact, <clears throat> it's one of the mistakes people have. Money is influential in politics, but votes will kick money's ass any time there is a fight. The most influential lobbyists in financial services are the smaller, are the large collections of smaller people. There was one major uh, change in the law that we adopted that went through. It was to exempt smaller banks from the Volcker rule, banks under 10 billion, because they have the cloud. You know, Bank of America, Citicorp, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, first of all, their employment is geographically concentrated. And secondly, people don't really like them uh, or actively hate them, like Wells has managed to get itself in that position. On the other hand, everybody's got community bankers in his or her district, and they are in the Rotary Club, and they sponsor Little League teams, and they're everybody's pal. So that's where the lobbying card is. You're exactly right. The big banks were unpopular. They had very little. We would decide what to do, and then, yes, we talked to some of the big banks about the manner, how, how would we word it so that it didn't do more than we wanted to. We would take their expertise. But uh, neither in the original bill nor in the uh, one big amendment that went through, the big banks have, you're exactly right, got none of what they wanted. Um, the small, all the exceptions were in the direction of the uh, smaller banks. The big banks were mad at the smaller banks for withdrawing their objections to the bill because we accommodated them 
on, uh, on, on some things. Um, it's also true, by the way, in insurance, although there's not much federal regulation of insurance, but the power in federal legislation and insurance is not MetLife and uh, Liberty Mutual, it's the independent insurance agents who are again in everybody's district. The one big defeat I suffered legislatively was an amendment that carved automobile dealers out of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. You would not ab initio think that the one area in America where consumers need no protection at all is in buying used cars. Um, but that is in fact the statement of our legislation. And what happened was the auto dealers lobbied against it. Now you talk about grassroots. You've all seen their commercials. It's Happy Harry and Joyful Joe and Come On Down and they're attractive characters. You sort of laugh at them, but they are all over everybody's district. And uh, I lost on a roll call vote to exempt uh, automobile dealers with no logic, just that they, uh, and by the way, subsequently, uh, it turns out now that the, the area where there had been the most problem with consumer loans was the one that was uh, exempted. So no, what it says about that bank lobby is, uh, in terms of legislation, on, once an issue becomes a big issue, they, they don't have any clout. When it's subsurface, then they have some clout. And unfortunately, they do have a lot of clout in the regulatory process, not politically so much as just the courts, particularly the conservatives who have been appointed to the courts, impose very strict requirements in, uh, that the administrators have to show. And the financial institutions, the big ones, have enormous amounts of money to hire lawyers and economists. The regulatory agencies are badly underfunded, deliberately to some extent, and there's a split, historical accident. But the, uh, the bank regulators are all funded independently by bank insurance at the FDIC, um, by uh, fees to become federally chartered to control the currency. But the derivatives, securities regulators, Securities Exchange Commission and Commodity Futures Trading Commission are dependent on appropriations. And the Republicans controlled the Congress, remember, from the day we passed the bill, the year after, till now, and they have starved both agencies. So they are outgunned badly in the regulatory process. And that's where the big banks have their clout, not politically, but in their ability to influence the courts. So the regulatory agent, the regulatory bodies are not captured, but they're just incapacitated? Is yeah, that? it's not as much captured. I mean, some of the Trump people are more favorable, but they are outgunned. And that could be resolved by a fairly easy amount of money. I mean, that's one of the things you'll see if the Democrats come in is, we're not talking hundreds of billions of dollars, but the, the CFTC, I mean, they got about a billion dollars here. The CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, takes in far more money for the federal government in fines than it gets as an appropriation. You cannot give them the fines to spend because you give them an incentive then, and that's not good law enforcement. But that's, that, that, that's again where the big banks have a major uh, leg up and, and it's because of that it disparity. When you're working on passing something big like the Dodd-Frank bill, how much of it is a process of playing different interest groups off against each other as opposed to this ideal of uh, representing the public interest? Again, very good. Uh, you start out with the latter, with the ideal. And in fact, in this case, is what happened was with this bill, we saw flaws in the system, the two flaws. The one, they said, where people could incur debt and then not have the ability to pay it back, so they took on more debt than they should. And then the fact that some of them, having taken on all that debt, were gonna collapse and then have a uh, sort of domino effect on everybody else. And there was essential agreement. Uh, there's a book coming out Columbia did with essays, and I, I say in my chapter, there's an incredibly strong degree of continuity between the Bush and Obama administrations on what should be in the regulation. Again, you know, people ask me when bipartisanship died. It died in uh, January 21st, 2009, when Obama became president, because we, the Democratic Congress, gave the Bush administration a great deal of cooperation, and they worked with us, the administration, not Congress, um, by the time they, uh, uh, when, we, when we were implementing it. But um, the, uh, 
I'm trying to think. We started out with this general agreement on what to do. And then you got into negotiating with the groups. You had to decide what was more important. And negotiating by, and, and you negotiate with groups, you're also associated with the members. And the members are not just uh, tools of the groups. I mean, these are serious people who have uh, uh, some idea. Uh, in terms of finally doing the bill when you have to get, and I used to go to sleep every night, uh, with, and I wouldn't count sheep, I'd count members. <laughs> uh, the, the year we, the second Congress when we passed it, we had 71 um, members of the committee, and I literally, uh, I couldn't fall asleep until I got to 36. I mean, I would be going through, through my head on these, uh, on these issues. And um, I, I've read two books in my life that I read for instruction in terms of, you know, not learning basic academic discipline, but about lessons to apply. Um, and one was Robert Cairo's chapter on Lyndon Johnson when he became minority leader. I became the minority leader of the committee in 2003, then later chairman. And I had, it was a similar situation. And what I took away from that was your job as a leader, since you can't order anybody to do anything in a legislative body, um, I mean, I was once asked if I was worried that Nancy Pelosi was going to be mad at me because I supported Steny Hoyer for majority leader over Jack Murtha. And my answer by that time was, no, I, I'm not afraid of my leader. I am afraid of my followers. Uh, they're the ones who can destroy you. And um, the answer was, you didn't, here's how you worked, or how I worked with the members. This is what I learned from Lyndon. Any chance you got, and I instructed my staff, any chance you got to do a favor for any of those members, do it. They were not quid pro quo. That doesn't work. You'd pretty soon get, get bankrupted. What you want to do is to create in them a vested interest in your friendship and in your success because they're going to get three or four or five things from you for every one you might ask them to get. Uh, and you do that and you recognize that, uh, but you also recognize their autonomy. And I, I, the metaphor I would use for trying to pass that bill was uh, it's kind of like doing a Rubik's Cube when all the individual squares have their own will. Um, what helped, by the way, was the fact that it was such a big bill. Because the bigger the bill, and this is why people criticize big legislation, but that also is, gives you the ability to trade off. You know, there's only one issue which is kind of hard to work out a deal with people who are either for it or against it. But in this major legislation, both with interest groups and with the members, I could trade off some. Well, if you can stick with me here, I can do that for you there. Uh, one example, um, again, I, I thought I'd made a secret deal, but your former colleague, Bob Kaiser, in an excellent book on, on the passage of the Act of Congress, got them to tell. I met with the head of the independent bankers. They didn't like the Consumer Bureau, and they don't like being examined, bank examiners. They don't have enough people around to talk to the examiners. So I made a deal with him that while the smaller banks would be covered by the substantive rules of the uh, Consumer Bureau, they wouldn't have a separate examiner from the Consumer Bureau. Plus, and here, interesting, we changed the formula for assessing banks for deposit insurance in a way that shifted a billion dollars a year from the big banks, from the smaller banks to the big banks. And so he then was neutral on the uh, on the bill. So that was a case of giving him a couple of things, uh, frankly, at, at the expense at this point. This was purely at the expense of the big banks. They knew they didn't have any, any real power. But yeah, you, you, as I said, you start with the ideal and then you try to make trade-offs, you know, the lower priority, uh, the better. But then also with the members, there are things you do like let somebody chair a hearing, let somebody make an opening statement, go to his or her district for a particular purpose. Does, that, does uh, what you're arguing suggest that it was a major error, error by the leadership, his Republican leadership, to get, to get, to rid, get of rid of earmarks? Your marks? Absolutely. Uh, that was a couple, every so often, you know, a guy, I, I am very critical of many of what my colleagues do. I'm not always enamored of journalists. But the people are no bargain either. And some of what we suffer from is illogic on the part of the public. And every so often they have this 
great reform move, uh, which expresses anger at the system, but in, in, at the wrong target. The first of those was term limits, which I thought was a terrible idea. Uh, secondly, the um, notion of doing away with earmarks. Earmarks are congressional designation about how to spend money, not adding to the overall total. There have been a couple of egregious, outrageous earmarks. Most earmarks, though, are very much democratic. In every case that I did an earmark, it had to do mostly with transportation or some other physical thing. And I was acting at the request of the people in the particular district affected who disagreed with the administrators at the federal or state level, particularly on highways. No, we, um, the Highway Administration, I don't know if some of you know, Commonwealth Avenue, Newton, a lovely street where the Boston Marathon goes with a mall in the middle. And some highway engineers decided uh, in the uh, 80s that that mall was a traffic hazard and they were gonna cut the mall in half. And I got legislation to say they wouldn't. No, I think the earmarks are both substantively, uh, they, they are, you can't make an exception on broad public policy for one neighborhood. They do affect physical placement of things or by putting a building somewhere. And uh, I think they're useful, but they also, as Tom's question you know, opens up, they are ways to get unpopular things done. Look, given the public can be very inconsistent. I complained one time to a city council in Boston, 1968, Freddie Langone, who he and his brother owned the Langone funeral home in the North End. And uh, we had been asked to build a swimming pool, people in one section of Boston, Hyde Park, then whites who said, oh, you only do things for black people. We need a swimming pool. So the mayor said, okay, give me a swimming pool. Pretty soon they were complaining about the blasting, the noise, the trucks coming in and out. And I said to Langone, Freddie, I don't know what these people want. First they want a swimming pool, now they're complaining because it's causing trouble. He said, hey kid, ain't you heard the news? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> people want things, but don't want the consequences of getting them. Well, that creates dilemmas, and there are times when you have to ask responsible members of Congress to do things, knowing that they'll probably be short-term unpopular. And that's right, one of my rules is, and it has to do with the speakers, majority leaders, even committee chairs, people should not be in positions of leadership and legislative bodies unless they have at least 15% to lose and still get reelected. You, you, one of the job of leaders is to absorb the heat. That's why Nancy Pelosi, one of the things she's been so successful is that she, she has that very supportive constituency. And um, uh, earmarks are a way to help leaders get members to do unpopular things. I, I uh, my, my, and I, by the way, from the time I got reelected in, in 19, I got reelected in 82 with 59% of the vote. From 84 through 2008, I either was unopposed or got 70% uh, of the vote or more. In 2010, after passing this bill and dealing with the crisis, I got 54%. Um, and uh, I, I got blamed. In fact, I, here, here's the problem, and it's an area that academics have uh, an advantage over politicians. We don't have counterfactuals. Economists have counterfactuals. You can look at something and then say, okay, but if we did it this way, here's what the result would have been. But you can't do experiments with, with real life. So um, we were in many cases convinced that what we did avoided more serious harm. But keeping things, the, the, the sure way to get in trouble politically is to go before the voters and say, you know what? We prevented things from getting worse. That is not acceptable. Uh, in fact, I joked and my staff actually made up the bumper sticker in 2010. And I said, but look, what I really would like to be able to say to people is, and they put it on the bumper sticker, things would have sucked worse without me. But um, that doesn't work, and, and earmarks are a way that you get around that uh, short-term irrationality in the public. How does uh, the nationalization of politics work? Congressional districts are now voting yeah. increasingly 
as they do for the president. And the, oh, it's president. hard for you to create a separate identity for yourself. How does that affect policy making? It, it makes it much harder to get things done um, because it means that your primary voters, it makes compromise very difficult because primary voters are generally less willing to compromise. Fascinating thing, when I went in college and afterwards, we had this contrast between the British system and the American system. The British system was strict party responsibility and the American system was not. That is now completely flipped. You look at Parliament dealing with Brexit and party discipline is broken down. You look at America and you have party discipline to a degree you've never had before. And that does make compromise very difficult because of this. Uh, and, and, and it also means um, the, the social costs to you of breaking with your party have gotten, it becomes much more significant. If you disagree with your party on a substantive issue, you should be fine, that's what you do. Now it's, uh, oh no, you're a, you're a betrayer. So it, it has made, uh, as I said, uh, compromise much more difficult and contributed to the gridlock. Is that true on both sides, Democrat and Republican? Um, yes, no it is. It started on the Republican side. Um, but the Democrats have now sort of Doing it, are doing it as well. That's one of the things that I think Nancy Pelosi may contribute. She's aware of that, and she, I, she was a headline, I think the Times today, saying, you know, Pelosi's working to try and restrain some of her, her left. Uh, members are, are, are aware of that, and um, I think our strategy is gonna be to find a lot of important issues where there's democratic consensus and do them and hopefully that will keep people from pressing for voter thing. But it, it, it started on the Republican side. Again, you go back and the Democratic Congress in 2007 and 8 cooperated with George Bush on doing things we knew were gonna be unpopular. And I talk about the TARP program, which lent money to banks. We got repaid totally. People said, why couldn't you do that for homeowners? We should have done more for homeowners. It was my one disagreement with Bush but the banks did pay it all back. I believe, and the TARP bought us time to then do better reform. I believe, historically, the TARP will go down as the most unpopular, highly successful thing the federal government ever did. We did that for Bush. Um, then Obama becomes president and the Republicans say, no, we can do everything we can to undermine him. And they began that and then ultimately the Democrats became the mirror image in self-defense. I'm going to move to uh, questions on the floor. One last one here, though. What's your take on the uh, Alexandria uh, Cortez and Ocasio uh, Cortez? Hometown, Anna Presley and this I, I, uh, of the I am concerned by them. Um, I think there was an unrealism there. Um, I think there was an overestimate. This is the thing that some of the ideologues do. There was an overestimate of the degree of public support they have. And, and, and you should not, I mean, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said, I refuse to believe that we can't do uh, Medicare for all right away. Well, refusing to believe, that's never a good thing, uh, particularly when we say it's accurate. Um, and I, I think they misidentify that. They see, and they're only a handful, but they see a, uh, a majority sentiment for their views in the country, which I wish was there, but I don't think is. And then they, um, they uh, are attacking other Democrats for not doing it. You know, one of the things I would note of these people on the left, none of them defeated a Republican. They all defeated liberal Democrats. Now the difference between them and most Democrats, I agree with them on some of those differences, but we will never reach that for years. And I, I think, that, and then I also believe the Green New Deal was a great mistake, the way they packaged it. Um, and uh, it is, the Republicans love to talk about it. I debate the former chairman of the committee, Jeb Hensley, uh, on uh, CNBC, and all he wants to do is talk about the Green New Deal. Um, they just, and then some of the Democrats were constrained from uh, opposing it, but if you notice, not even Bernie Sanders wanted to vote for it. Um, so I, I think they are, they are 
unwise in their strategy. They think the way to get what they want is to insist that the Democratic Party move further left uh, without worrying about uh, getting things done first. And by the way, uh, on Medicare, I'm ultimately I would like to see universal Medicare, but there's still a lot of resistance. Doing something is not just settling for less. It's proving that that's a good thing and you can build on it. The more people that enjoy Medicare, the more support you can have for expanding it. Do those on the left threaten the Democratic majority in the House by having it portrayed as in the hands of socialists and so forth? If we don't make it different, I think they, what worries me is they more threaten the chance of winning in November because the presidential candidates have felt in kind to sort of make supportive noises, although I think they're pulling back from that now. Um, I, think in, I think members of the House, well, here's the deal. By the time we're running for re-election, people are running for re-election, it will be clear that the House is not doing the Green New Deal. Members of the House will be able to say, look, that's not happening, I wasn't for it, I voted against it. So I think individual members of the House will be better able to defend themselves against this guilt by association. It's the presidential candidates who I worry about. Let's switch to the uh, floor. People who want to ask questions, should they stand up, sir? Yeah, I have two microphones in the house, so if anybody has a question they'd like to ask Mr. Frank. You have it. Hold it up. So given the current situation, uh, how much risk do you see a, a repeat financial crisis similar to the one that hit us in 2007, 2008? I see very little chance of a financial crisis. Um, I do think the economy is slowing down politically. Um, it's interesting that uh, Trump talks about how good it's doing, but he also attacked the Fed for acting as if it was doing good. I mean, this insistence on, on holding up. But I have to say about Donald Trump, just supposedly a great executive. First of all, he doesn't, he completed almost none of the deals he boasts about. But the other thing is, I've never seen anybody with such a terrible record of appointing people. The most important people he's appointed in national security, law enforcement, and the economy, he denounces. This isn't me. He says they're no good. He says the Secretary of State was a dumb. He says that the chairman of the Federal Reserve that he appointed doesn't understand how the economy works. He, Jeff Sessions, I mean, it, it's just extraordinary. Um, but I don't see it as a crisis for two reasons. First of all, they're all better capitalized. Well, I take it back. First of all, they, they are not taking as much risk. The kind of bad loans that were made, the kind of derivative contracts that were sold, these days most derivatives are sold through exchanges and there's money behind them. Secondly, even though there will then be losses, the larger institutions in particular are, have more reserve. And finally, we do have, you know, we have this too big to fail. This is argument. Here's what now happens. If a large financial institution can't pay its debts, the federal government steps in, takes it over, liquidates its assets, pays only as much of the debt as it has to to prevent there from being a domino effect, and then recovers any of that from other large financial institutions. Um, I, I, I think that that backstop works, and you know, Paul Volcker and others do, but um, we're very unlikely to get to it. So no, I don't, I don't think, now, Having said that, I should say this. We have this deal where we regulate and then the financial industry or any business innovates. And at some point, the innovations outrun the regulations. And if you don't act quickly enough to put in new regulations, it blows up. So I can't tell you what the, new, what the innovations will be, the new digitalization, the PayPal and all those. It is conceivable that they will create a new problem 10, 15, 20 years from now. So I, I, I'm sure we won't have the problem we had before, only though if we are alert to the need to have regulation keep up. And you see that in the Trump people, the SEC is talking about um, liberalizing, uh, increasing regulation of the Bitcoin stuff. But I think we're safe from what we had before. I had the mic. 
So one uh, question is, among the newer members of Congress, who do you think have the discipline and knowledge to become a great legislator, particularly in the financial area? You bring the mic a little down from you. Okay. Uh, among the newer members of Congress, who do you think have the discipline and the knowledge to become a legislator in the financial area in future of a, that can bring in compromise and what needs to be done? Um, you have uh, uh, the committee system works well. You know, there are some serious members of Congress, some less serious, but in every committee there are. And Congress is, to some extent, a meritocracy. Your influence over your colleagues in public policy does get bought by your expertise and your political judgment. And I think there are, there are a number of members who have that. Even more important, and the greatest bargain the American people get are the men and women who work for members of Congress, staff members, who have an enormous degree of skill, all of whom could be making a lot more money outside and not have to deal with constituents who can be, and you gotta be constrained. Um, so I do think there, there is enough. Even there, the, the, it has to be a working relationship with the executive branch. They will take the A. So the answer is enough who have the expertise and who have demonstrated that to other members so that I, I'm not worried about. Now, there might be a political obstacle to doing some of these things. But one of the complaints that some people make is that uh, our system for avoiding another crisis won't work because if a big bank gets into trouble and can't pay its debts, there will be enormous pressure on the president and the secretary of treasury to bail them out. My answer is no. There would be enormous pressure on the president and secretary of treasury to shoot them. I mean. Uh, in fact, the more intelligent critique is the one that comes from some people, including Tim Geithner, that we constrain the ability to bail them out too much. But my answer is, they said there might be a specific circumstance where that's necessary. My answer is, if they're rich, you're going to have to prove it to Congress, because the public will not accept that standby authority. Do we have other questions? While they're going there, should Obama have indicted some of these guys? I think so. Here's the problem. First of all, I, I don't mean to duck it, but we didn't have criminal jurisdiction. That's in the Judiciary Committee. Here's part of the problem, though. And I do think they should have gone after him. Wherever they did a criminal charge against an institution, I don't know why they, they it would have meant what to do against an individual. But there was this problem. A large part of the problem was that things that were wrong were not illegal until we passed the law. Um, the, 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 somebody just asked me today about one of them involving a, 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 a game, I forget who was, who was for breakfast, spoofing. about spoofing on derivatives. And it's now a crime and it wasn't uh, before. The other thing though is I have to remind my liberal friends, we're the ones who believed in uh, due process. And an element of due process is you should not be, you cannot be constitutionally criminally prosecuted unless you could know fairly certain that the behavior was against the law. Now that doesn't contradict ignorance of the law is no excuse. You are responsible for knowing what the law is. But if the law is in fact unknowable, ambiguous, due process means you can't be, you shouldn't be convicted for that. So I, I wish they had done more, but I, and the other, and the other point too is, in fairness to them, the record of convictions that the Justice Department got was at its worst in some of these complicated financial crimes. It's kind of easy to kind of glaze the jury's eyes over. So I, I, I share that sentiment, but I, I, uh, I'm tentative about it. I, I can't think of any case where they absolutely should have gone after somebody. Who's there next? The question was just answered. Um, at the time of the government bailout, was there any thought of preventing those firms like AIG from turning around and then paying the bonuses to the executives? Yeah, we had a bit, my one fight with Paulson, one of them. We did put limits on compensation in there. The most distressing thing, I heard, Hank Paulson, a very good guy, Secretary of Treasury, former head of Goldman Sachs, he objected to our putting compensation constraints for the top officers 
on the money because he said some of them won't take it. I said, that's the most unpatriotic thing that they could do. You're telling me that, you know, you think we're unfair to these people? And they, they, they were all so rich anyway. And um, so we did put some constraints on. Um, and, and we were able to keep them. But here was the one problem. AIG, which I said was in for $170 billion, not knowing how much they owed. It turned out they had contractually agreed to pay bonuses to the very people who had incurred that debt. And when that came out in February of 2009, a, that is a major factor, by the way, Keep I'm glad you asked the question. It's a major factor in the anger. It was an accelerant. Uh, people remember being, they don't remember why, they, they're angry. I, I was more afraid of the stability of the, of the country. It was kind of like the scene where the villagers were out there with the torches and pitchforks to get the monster. Um, the problem was, in fairness to Geithner, it was constitutionally impossible to take the bonuses back, to order them not to. I mean, we tried, I even, I made a mistake, said, well, we want to know the names of the people. I had to retract that. It was, cops said, don't, don't do that. You're gonna have people get shot. So we retracted that. But um, the, every, you know, there's no uh, contracts clause of the Constitution that was held to apply. We just, we wanted, we, we did restrict them going forward. The big problem was the, uh, the bonuses AIG had already agreed to pay and there was no way to stop it. And that made people furious. By the way, even better, the man who had been the head of AIG, who then had been forced out, but he's the founder, Maurice Greenberg, he later sued the federal government on the grounds that AIG uh, had been unfairly treated by being taken over. They were seventy billion billion in debt. And uh, actually the Court of Claims found that technically he had an argument that they had followed the law and they awarded him a dollar in uh, awards. But I, when I heard about that lawsuit, him suing the federal government, I said it was kind of like the arsonist suing the fire department for water damage. Um, <laughs> but but that, the AIG bonuses, we, we just, we couldn't stop them retroactively. We did slow them down prospectively. Do you believe that uh, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, big data and modeling played a role in a significant role? Uh, do you believe that artificial intelligence, big data, and, and generally modeling of risk played a big role in, uh, in the financial crisis, or do you think it's trivial? Not then. I worry about that for the future. But I think it was, it was I mean, the, uh, it wasn't a lack of knowledge. I, I think um, it was, look, I'll put it this way. I think a lot of those people made loans and sold loans that they knew were no good. But they had a system whereby they were gonna not get bitten in by it. So, I mean, I think that's the AI and it may be too automatic for the future. I don't think that was the problem at the time. Because remember, these things started in the late 90s. I don't think that, that the, the uh, Digitalization had moved over. Intellectual uh, IT was a factor. You could not have taken all those loans and securitized them by hand. So the IT helped, but people knew what they were doing. The problem was uh, you did have the, uh, and it could have been a problem, if the credit rating agencies, Standard Poor's, Moody's, they told buyers whether or not these were good investments. Now that could theoretically have been an AI problem if they had misanalyzed them. But the thing is, they didn't analyze them at all. I mean, it was it, the most important, Michael Lewis um, book is great on it. It's a, the worst failure, abuse. The credit rating agencies, the problem is that credit rating agencies work for the people who are selling the, the, the credits. So they have this incentive to say everything is good. And they, they said that these mortgages were gonna pay off, and they didn't even check them, they didn't sample them, they had no idea, I mean, they just made shit up. But it was the worst thing. We haven't been able to figure out a way to undo it, because here's the problem. Ideally, you would have them work for the buyers, 
but there were so many potential buyers, there's no way to, to, to make that a transaction. But I, that's why I said, I don't think it was AI. Maybe if they had tried to analyze them, but they didn't even get that far. I mean, they, they just looked at them and said, okay. Okay, we're gonna take one more question. Does anybody have anything? Oh, I was, my question was around activism and your suggestions for influencing sh social change. I've heard you say before that marching won't do us any good. Going in and making, exerting policy changes is, is where you're voting. going to make yeah, the difference. That's what I said, but the influence is, our, uh, is voting. Look, 2009, two groups of people get very angry, and the bonuses were part of it. The right wing became the Tea Party, the left became uh, Occupy, and there were differences. The right wing, these, you know, they're patriots, they believe in the Constitution, they got the hats. They organized, took over the Republican Party. They got everybody to vote, they voted in primaries, they took over the Republican Party. Occupy smoked dope and beat drums, and that didn't have much impact on my colleagues. I mean, I agreed much more with Occupy, not entirely. But that was an example, and, and the expressive emotive stuff doesn't help. I, what I'm encouraged by now is that people voted in 2018, and they saw that it worked, and I think that's the way that you, uh, you, you, uh, you do it. Okay. I think we now get free food, which for journalists and academics is a major draw. Uh, yes, can we put our hands together and thank our two speakers thank today? Thank you, very good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.